Okay, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm happy to be among this group. This is a really interesting meeting, and one of the things I wanted to mention is that I think it's great that we're bringing eating disorders and obesity into the same discussion because this isn't something we see everywhere. I think a lot of people in our field sort of see these at still opposite ends of the spectrum, but we know from the science that that's not the case and the two can really inform treatments for each other. So I'm, I'm really happy that we're doing that today. So my lab's interested in what makes people eat in ways that are not healthy and what causes people to make certain types of food choices or choices about whether or not they're going to eat something um, that might result in uh, aberrant behaviors later on. And so we look at animal models and also more recently clinical studies in order to try to understand the neurobiological mechanisms that might explain some of the decisions that people make about food. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing today. So. <laughs> I want to start off by noting that although we're here under sort of the rubric of thinking about eating disorders and obesity, clearly there's no one cause of obesity. Obesity is a multifaceted disorder. And so I have listed up here a variety of different potential factors that relate to the obesity epidemic. And I think that the cause of obesity we'll find is a combination of a little bit of all these things depending on who the individual is. But one of the things I want to mention is that I'm really focusing on thinking about this sort of piece that's on the end here, this idea about food reward in a term called hedonics. Aside from all these other factors which we know contribute to obesity, we know increases in portion sizes, stress factors, social norms regarding the way we think about food, sedentary lifestyle, all the things that we've been hearing about, we know that these are certainly causes of obesity and lead to it. But one of the things that I think is becoming a little bit more contemporary that more of us are starting to really sort of think about is how is it that the foods that have been engineered to taste really good and the palatability and the pleasure that's associated with eating, how might that play into all this? And how might that cause us to maybe sometimes eat in ways that are not healthy? So this is where I wanted to introduce this concept of hedonic eating versus caloric need. And so we know that we need to eat for calories. We need to eat because we need energy. That's why we have food. But it turns out that not everybody eats for calories. People eat for other reasons these days. And so people report that they eat because they like to eat, because they're bored, or because they're stressed, or they're lonely. Eating engender something in them that makes them feel better or makes them feel good. And so that's thinking about the hedonic aspects of food, not necessarily the caloric needs of the food. Well, it turns out when we look at the foods that cause this pleasure or lead us to like them, they actually happen to be foods that are rich in things like fats and sugars and consequently calories. And they also lead to th uh, the reason why they taste good. And as we all know, these types of processed, palatable foods that are high in added sugars and fats, they're somewhat ubiquitous now in our society. You could pretty much go anywhere these days and find access to these things. I even saw a vending machine for macaroni and cheese here in the lobby. Um, so you can really get access to these types of foods pretty much wherever you go. And it's also the case that foods become a big part of our social life. You know, I think as humans, we've always congregated around food, but we've taken that to a whole nother level. I think many of us think about the times we get together with people, it's usually around some sort of food item or caloric beverage. And so together as a group, we tend to get together around food. And so we're finding that these are ways in which food is being injected into our life that might cause us to be eating it, not because we're necessarily hungry, but because it tastes good. So I am a, uh, I have a PhD in psychology and neuroscience, and so I like to think about these behaviors and these psychological principles and how the brain might help us to understand them better. And so this is a very simple diagram looking at part of the brain reward system, if you will. And so one of the things that we've been studying is how this brain reward system might be activated or overactivated by these highly palatable foods. Well, it turns out that this primitive brain reward system is there, and one of the functions that it serves is to reinforce natural behaviors. So we need to do a couple things to make sure we survive. We need to eat, for one, but we also need to mate. And so it makes sense that those things are activating a reward system in the brain so that we continue to engage in them. Well, it turns out that one of the reasons why drugs of abuse are so darn problematic is that they're activating the same primitive brain reward system, but they're setting it into overdrive. And so the question that we've had um, been looking at over the past more than a few years now is could some of these high sugar, high calorie foods that we're seeing in our modern food environment be acting more like drugs where they're overactivating this primitive brain reward system? 
So that's the question I began to ask. I started doing this work quite a while ago, back in graduate school. I was at Princeton working with Bart Hobel. And we had seen from Mark's work and from some other people in the substance abuse field these ideas about overlaps between obesity and substance dependence. But the somewhat limiting factor was that there really wasn't an animal model. There was no way that we could test it. So that's what we decided to do. And so this is a summary of a review paper that I wrote back in 2008, which at the time had summarized the work that we had done to try to characterize a model of addiction to food. So what we did was we took the DSM criteria for substance dependence and began to systematically just do a whole bunch of experiments and see if we could see addiction to sugar emerging. I'm not going to go into why we chose sugar to begin with. There's just not enough time, but I think you could sort of deduce from perhaps Dr. Lustig's discussion why we went that route. But here, I'm going to talk about some of the data um, in detail. But basically, we were able to find evidence of all the DSM-4 criteria for substance dependence with our animal model in which animals were simply given a sugar solution to drink and they were voluntarily allowed to overconsume it. So a couple of the things that we noted that I think are of interest, um, rats that are overeating highly palatable foods will engage in a lot of these addiction-like behaviors. They show signs of tolerance. They also show signs of withdrawal. We were able to measure this looking at signs of anxiety, signs of depression. We were also able to look in their brains and we see alterations in the release of neurochemicals that are consistent with what you would see during withdrawal from drugs of abuse. On the top graph, there's a, this is actually taken from a colleague's, uh, Mary Baggiano's work. She did some similar work where she was looking at animals that were prone to overeating versus resistant. She calls them binge prone versus binge resistant. And these animals that are prone to do it are willing to do some pretty crazy things like cross an electrified shock grid to get access to an M&M. And so I think that that sort of speaks to the idea that these animals are engaging in behaviors that are risky and aversive. And these are, again, very addiction-like DSM uh, criteria that we think about when we think about substance dependence. But here we're talking about food. Um, so one of the things that we did when we decided to look at the brains of these animals, because we could clearly see these behaviors emerging, but we wondered whether or not the um, brains were showing similar changes as what we would see during an addiction to a drug. As many of you probably know, one of the hallmarks of drug addiction is that it releases dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. Every time the rats or we were to take a hit of any type of drug, it releases dopamine. Food also can release dopamine, but when it comes to food, the dopamine release is more associated with the novelty of the food. And so once the very first time you eat at a, you know, a restaurant where you're tasting a new cuisine, you want to make sure you're paying attention and your brain's paying attention because if you get sick, it could kill you. And so your dopamine system is not only associated with the extreme learning that we see with relation to addiction, but also with learning of everyday types of behaviors. And so what we see is that with a food, after time, that dopamine release tends to habituate once the food is coded as being safe. We don't release dopamine every time we eat food. We do release it every time we do drugs. The question we had is, what's going to happen to our rats that are overeating sugar? Are they going to look more like rats that are doing drugs or eating food? And lo and behold, when we did a, a technique called in vivo microdialysis, this is where we can stick a little probe in the rat's brain and they walk around and we can pull out extracellular fluid and see how much dopamine is available while they're engaging in the behavior. We find that while the animals are drinking sugar, if they're sugar overeating or sugar binging, they're releasing dopamine every single time we give them access to sugar. What's interesting is we don't see that happening in animals that are given sugar ad libitum. These are animals that have it around. They just snack on it once in a while. They don't overeat it. So it's not the sugar per se, but it's the amount or the um, way in which the animals are consuming it. So here these animals are looking like what you would see with an animal that was addicted to a drug and not necessarily like what you'd see if the animal was simply just eating a, a palatable food for the first time. And we don't see this happening with standard food when we give our rats there are healthy rat chow, which is sort of like, I guess, the equivalent of a salad for us, maybe. Um, the animals, even if they're given limited access to it, where they're binging on it or forced to binge on it because they only have a certain amount of hours each day to consume it, they don't show this change in dopamine. It's something about 
overeating sugar or the palatable food that seems to be causing these addiction-like changes in the brain. And I had it on the previous slide. We've also shown, similar to what Gene Jack's shown in his work, changes in dopamine receptors, changes in gene expression that are, again, consistent with this idea that these are addiction-like changes in the brain and not like what we would expect to see with food. So um, I know Ashley talked a bit about this work in her presentation, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but we are now doing translational work where we're trying to take our rat studies and sort of see what we can do to help understand how we might think about treating humans, because I think the neurobiology that we're learning about this type of eating might inform our pharmacological treatments. So we've been um, working with the Yale Food Addiction Scale, and I won't go through what this means because Ashley explained it, but it's a way in which we can assess some of these things that we were able to see in our rats, perhaps now in people. This is from a, uh, a review paper that Mark and I are working on that's going to be out in Nature Endocrinology soon. This is a, a summary of all the papers that have been published using the Yale Food Addiction Scale and looking at the different populations. And one of the things I want to point out is that when we look at specific groups of, of people, such as those are, who are obese, that have binge eating disorder, we see much higher rates of people meeting the criteria for having a food addiction. And we don't have it on, added on here yet. But we're also working with looking at not only obese people, but also patients who have anorexia and bulimia. Because again, I think that our, our data are suggesting that they also may have high numbers here as meeting criteria for addiction to food. They're not necessarily addicted to the food in the sense that they want to consume it, but they're addicted to it in the sense that they're uh, uh, having obsessions about it. So another thing I want to mention is that, um, you know, we're beginning to sort of move beyond just thinking about sugar. What is it about the sugar? What kinds of foods might be addictive if we're going to talk about food being addictive? We've been noting that there are different brain mechanisms that are associated with overeating sugars versus fats. And this is where we're starting to get into trying to understand more about how these two types of dominant nutrients might uh, have different effects on addiction-like behavior. So one of the things that we've been looking at in my lab, this is a recent paper that came out, is trying from a molecular level to understand what is it about a high-fat diet that might be associated with attenuating these addiction-like changes. Because what we see is that rats that are overeating sugars will show clear signs of withdrawal, clear signs of addiction and changes in the brain. But when we add fat, something happens. It attenuates the effects of the addiction. And so it does seem to be that foods that are predominant in sugar seem to be the ones that are more powerful at producing these addiction-like brain changes. And so in my lab, we're working now to look at um, some neuropeptides such as galanin, which is a fat-stimulated neuropeptide in the hypothalamus, to see if we could target that to see if it might help us to understand a bit more about why we don't see these addiction-like changes more so with fat as we do with sugar. Um, again, and then this is sort of a little bit out of order, but um, we recently started to do some work with the Yale Food Addiction Scale and trying to measure whether or not people who have eating disorders, such as anorexia and bulimia, or eating disorders not otherwise specified, might meet the criteria for having these types of addiction-like responses in response to different types of foods. And so what we've done is taken the YFAS and developed subscales where we can look at sugar-rich foods versus fat-rich foods versus healthy foods like fruits and vegetables. And so these data are very preliminary, so I'm a little bit hesitant to even put it up, and we're working uh, to recruit more subjects for these studies. But it does seem that sugar and fat addiction symptoms counts are higher in patients that have BN compared to those with anorexia and nervosa, and I think this is consistent with what others are talking about as well. And interestingly, the fat addiction, using the fat scales, seem to be the symptom counts are higher in the um, bulimia nervosa compared to the EDNOS group. Again, it's a very small sample, so we need to do more work in this space, but it does sort of lead us down this road of thinking about how we might be considering what happens with eating disorders along with what happens with obesity as well. So I want to get into, uh, spend the last few minutes I have talking about treatments, and this is something that I think w will really help us when we're thinking about sort of doing this translational work and bringing the rat work into the, the clinical realm and trying to help us understand better ways to treat these types of addictive overeating. So one of the things that we've been doing is looking at uh, the GABA agonists such as baclofen. The sort of overall picture here is that we can learn a lot from the addiction world and if we can take some 
compounds and drugs that have been useful to some extent in treating drug addiction and maybe see how they might be effective in treating overeating or food addiction, if you will. That's really the, the way in which we're going here. So we've been doing some work with baclofen. It seems that the effects are stronger with fat than with sugar. Again, when we give this drug to our rats, if the rats have a high fat diet, baclofen seems to do a good job of attenuating intake. If we have sugar on board, baclofen is less effective. I, I think this speaks to the idea that if we're talking about treating overeating or treating abnormal eating behaviors, we can't think about suppressing appetite. I think we need to be more specific in our targets. We need to target the type of food that the people are overeating, the type of foods that are problematic. We know from the history of the pharmaceuticals of obesity treatment that appetite suppressants aren't very effective and they don't seem to be working. And so I think if we do this targeted hedonic route in terms of our treatment, it might be helpful in moving forward. We've also done some work with naltrexone. Um, Dr. Gold and I find that the combination of baclofen and naltrexone in our animal model seems to be effective at reducing hedonic eating in the sense that it's reducing the intake of the palatable foods, but has no effect on standard chow. So it's not an appetite suppressant, it's suppressing intake of the thing that the rats shouldn't be eating, the thing that they're eating for hedonic purposes, not for caloric need. Um, and this just got accepted. So we can change that. <laughs> um, and finally, we, uh, we're working with Gilead, looking at a um, ALDH2 inhibitor, which has downstream effects on the dopamine system, um, which has been used in treating alcohol and cocaine. We've also found that it reduces binge intake of palatable food. So again, this is another treatment that seems to be useful in the treating drug addiction, and it may also be useful in treating this type of addictive overeating. And. I have 10 seconds. <laughs>